All right, good time worshiping the Lord. And now we continue to worship Him as we study His Word. If you've got Bibles, turn to Ephesians chapter 4. And you can uh, keep one finger there, and then if you would, grab another place at Romans chapter 12. You'll be doing well, to start at least. I had a dream last night. <clears throat> I don't always remember them, but this one, um, it was our church service, and there was a, a new gal that was there. Couldn't pick her out of a lineup, not a real person, but uh, in the dream, she um, came to know Jesus during the service, and after the service, she was so excited, and she looked at me, and she said, I need a Bible now, and I said, you bet, let me get you one, and I couldn't find a Bible anywhere. I went all over. It wasn't even this building. It was some other wacko building place. You know how dreams are. Um, and so I'm looking all over in this building I know nothing about to try and find this woman a Bible, and I couldn't for the life of me. None of you had Bibles. You weren't even in the dream, to be honest with you. It was a bunch of strangers. Um, but in, in the end, I woke up, and I, I, I thank the Lord that we have Bibles. I thank the Lord that we have the Word of God to study. I thank the Lord that we're not without His truth, His words of life. I mean, you know, in a very real way, that kind of scenario can be pretty scary if somebody wants to know about God, but they can't find out how to know Him. And, but then we have freely Bibles that we can open up and we can say, ah. Oh. And you know, men and women, that's why I am also privileged to teach God's Word on a weekly basis. It's why I don't start with one verse in the Bible and then talk for 35 minutes about whatever I want to talk about. It's why we look through God's Word verse by verse and line by line, because it is the living Word. Amen? Amen. So this morning, we're going to do a deep dive into something that we covered last week, albeit briefly. And because one of my spiritual gifts is teaching, um, I can't just talk about something on a little bit. If I cover it, I'm like, I want to talk more. I want to share more. I want the congregation, I want the people that are in the room and the ones watching online, I want them to discover more about what it is. And so if you got Bibles, where we left off last week, I want to read it again. It's something that we saw. Paul writes, but to each one of us, grace was given. Who says amen to that? We are freely given His grace, and it's according to the measure of Christ's gift. And you got to know the measure of Christ's gift is more than we could ever take in, more than we could ever exhaust. His grace is inexhaustible. His grace has no ends, no bounds, no limits, no bottom or top. It is immeasurable, right? That's Christ's gift. And so he says... And he, Jesus, gave himself, gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. These are Christ's gift to the church, the leadership of the church, as these were in the case of the apostles and prophets, of which the Bible says the foundation of the church was built on, right? Those early apostles, the 12 of them, minus one, and then adding another, Mattathias, who we never hear anything about, and then adding another named Paul, the apostle, of which we read his book. They were foundational, and then it says Jesus is the chief cornerstone of that foundation. And then it goes on to the case today of evangelists, pastors, and teachers. They were given to grow the body of Christ, to mature the body of Christ. And he goes on to say, and I want to read it again, that he gave these leaders for the equipping of you, the saints, me, the saints. That's what saints are, believers in Jesus Christ, yeah? Don't, don't, don't get the whole Catholic thing going on, and, you know, sainthood, and, and you're going to be doing miracles, and as soon as you can perform two miracles and go in front of a council or at least have your name brought in front of council because most saints have to be dead. How many of you are dead here this morning? No, we're alive in Jesus Christ, amen? We are all called saints. It's one of the many terms and phrases, or words rather, that is used of believers in Jesus Christ. He says, the body was given the church leadership, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. 
You and I, we have all ministry to do. We have work to do, right? We saw in Ephesians 2.10 several weeks ago that all of us are Christ's workmanship and, and that we all have good works prepared in advance to walk in. If you're taking notes, that's Ephesians 2.10. All of us have good works to do. Ministry is service. That's what the word is, diakonos. It means service. For here's why it is that we do the work of ministry and why it is that we teach God's word to equip us for the edifying of the body of Christ till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man. Now, Take that out of your head, all right? Wives, don't think your husband's ever going to be perfect. Uh, you might want that, but no, probably not, because none of us are, including you and me. It literally means mature or complete. That's what that Greek word means, uh, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be. Here's what maturity looks like. Here, here's what a body that's being equipped a body that's doing works of ministry, serving one another, and serving this world, um, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine, all these false teachings that the enemy wants to use. And we know it's the enemy because here's what Paul says where they originate from, by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of what kind of plotting? Who is the father of lies? Who is the one that wants to lead people astray? It is the enemy, and he uses uh, people that avail themselves to him, not in some sort of weird way, but in a very, very real way, using their own ambition, their own selfishness, their own evil, sinful desires. People are led astray. And he says, that's not what he wants for the church of God. He wants us to be mature instead, but there's the adversative. But speaking the truth in love, that you and I as the church may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share. See how he says twice, every and every? Every joint supplies and every part does it share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Last week, I stated the statement twice, in the body of Christ, we are all needed. In the body of Christ, we all have spiritual gifts. Now, he talks about spiritual gifts here. And this is how we're going to grow as individuals and as a corporate church body, as we all get evolved and jump in and use what God has given us. And you might say, well, I don't know what my spiritual gift is. I'm not an evangelist, nor am I. I'm not a pastor or teacher. Um, there are those, and you don't have to be, because the Bible actually has a whole bunch of other gifts that it says Jesus has given. And this is where I want to look at for the next couple of weeks, these other gift lists, because I want you to know, if you don't already, what your gift is. And I want you to, to operate in that gift if you already know what it is, that you would know what your spiritual gift or gifts are, and then more than just knowing that, but that we'd all then go out and start to use those spiritual gifts for the building up of this church body or whatever other church body we're a part of, amen? And so that's what I want to spend a couple of weeks looking at, spiritual gifts. Like I said last week, we had the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, and there are those that say the pastor-teacher is actually one, one position, one role, and I actually believe it's two different positions, but if you want to see it that way, that's fine. Today, I want to look at what are usually called the ministry gifts. That's why I asked you to turn to Romans chapter 12. So if you've got Bibles, flip there. And the gifts that Paul is going to talk about to the church of Rome are seven. So we had the five there in the list of Ephesians 4. And this morning, we're going to see seven more spiritual gifts. And then next week, we're going to close with what's called the manifestation gifts of the Holy Spirit found in 1 Corinthians 12. If you want to read ahead, you can do that. But seven more gifts today, they are prophecy, service, teaching, encouragement, giving, and leadership. 
These are spiritual gifts that Jesus gives to his body for his glorification and so that the church, the body, would be built up together and come to maturity. And as I'm talking about these, I want you to think through, which am I? Right now, even before I get into it, do you know what your spiritual gift or gifts are? And you might say, well, I didn't even know someone gave me one. I didn't even know that that's a part of this whole, how the whole thing works. And, and, and we just read, obviously, that it is, by which every part supplies, right? There, there's nobody in the body of Christ that can say, well, I, I'm not into that. I wasn't given a gift. I'm just going to watch from the sidelines. Christianity is a participatory sport, yeah? Christianity is something that we get involved in. We, we don't just let happen to us, but Jesus says, no, when you accepted me, I'm going to fill you with my spirit. Amen to that. And then not only am I going to fill you with my spirit, but the spirit is going to give you, I want to give you through the spirit, spiritual gifts that you and I can operate in to bring him glory and to bring the church body to maturity. We are all needed in the body of Christ. Um, I left off mercy there at the end, so there are seven. Seven gifts that Paul writes about to the church of Rome. Let's read it together. Romans 12, 1 through 8. Paul says, I beseech you. There's that word. I exhort you. I encourage you. Admonish you. Therefore, he says, brethren, by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service, or some of your versions say, act of worship. I like that. He says, and do not be conformed to this world. The NIV says, do not be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world. We'll talk about that in a second. Don't be conformed to this world. That word conformed literally is the idea of being pressed into the mold of. Don't be pressed into the mold of this world, but instead be transformed by the renewing of your mind. How do we renew our minds as Christians? with God's word, amen, with reading God's word, with living out God's word, that you may prove, he says, what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he or she ought to think, but rather to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. Don't be haughty, don't be arrogant, don't think you're all that, because none of us are. It's not about us, it's about Jesus, amen? We respond to what God wanted to do for us. We don't prove or earn or initiate with God, God initiated with us. We are humble, and we are saved and forgiven and given grace and mercy, not because we proved ourselves to God, but because God, he loves us just the way we are. And so we can think of ourselves rightly with humility. He goes on, for as we have many members, and we do, in one body, the members that he's talking about, but all the members do not have the same function in the body, do they? So we, being many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. So there it is, having gifts. It's not a question mark. It's not an if. You and I all have spiritual gifts, at least one, and I believe a combination of several. We have ways that God wired us, and these are not fruits. Galatians 5.22 says, right, for the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Those are the nine fruits of the Spirit that God is wanting to grow in all of us. These are not fruits. These are special endowments that Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, gives to us for different needs. And I, and I want you to hear this. When it comes to spiritual gifts, they're not mine. They're not yours. You, you, someone doesn't walk around and say, well, I have the gift of giving. I have the gift of leadership. I have the gift of teaching. I have the gift. Okay, you are bestowed or given that gift, but realize it's not your gift to keep. The person who needs the giving is the one whose gift it is. You're just the conduit. I'm just the conduit. We're just the conduit through whom God wants to give whoever needs something. If somebody needs a word of wisdom, we'll get to that next week. If somebody needs a word of knowledge, I don't go around like, I'm the word of wisdom guy. Just ask me for wisdom and I'll give it to you. 
No, God will supernaturally give us when the time is right and if a person is in need and if we're open to that, Lord, speak through me a word of wisdom for this person. You know how many times when I meet with people, you know how many times when somebody says, hey, pastor, let's go out to lunch. I have something I need to talk about. When I get a phone call at the church office, you know, hey, pastor, can you pray with me? Right away, I pray, Lord, give me your words to say. Don't help me. I don't want to counsel somebody in my futile wisdom. I, you know, I've only got so much. Lord, give me words of wisdom that this person needs to hear. Lord, give me words of knowledge that this person needs to hear. Lord, give me the words of encouragement that this person, whatever this person needs, it's their gift, it's not mine. You got it? We're just the ones through whom God can give the gift. And so hold loosely, re-gift, generously, liberally, always re-gift. And that's the way the whole thing is supposed to work. So when it comes to these gifts specifically here, what he says, if prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Gift number one, the prophetic word. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministering. Some of your versions, the word is service. Gift of service, ministry. And never forget that ministry is service. When it comes to the church, I, as a minister, am here to be a servant to you people. You people are not here for me or the church ministry team or the church leadership. Whenever a pastor or church leadership begins to see the people is there for them, they have it all backwards. You're not here for us or me. We are here for you to serve you. We are here to meet your needs or encourage you or love you or build you up. That's the right way to see ministry, and that's the way that Jesus presented ministry, did he not? I didn't come to be served, he said, but to serve, to give myself away. And how many of us are thankful for that reality? Jesus was a ministry maniac. I love it. If it's ministry, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching. There he, he actually uses another one that he, he talked about in Ephesians 4. The gift of teaching, very important. He who exhorts, some of your versions say encourages, same thing, in exhortation. He who gives with liberality, the gift of giving. He who leads with diligence. If you're going to lead, do it diligently, if that's the gift you've been given. And he who shows mercy with what? Show mercy with cheerfulness. Now, before we break this down and look at how it all works practically, I want to remind you what these gifts are for. I've said it already, and I'm going to say it a few more times just for emphasis sake. These gifts are, one, to build up the body of Christ, yeah? And two, they are to glorify Jesus Christ. They are to build up the body of Christ. The gifts are given. These and all the other ones we're going to look at. And to glorify Jesus Christ to help us all grow up into maturity in our faith. In order for that to happen, we need each other to grow up in our faith. That might be something you've never contemplated or considered. A lot of times people approach Christianity as a personal relationship with Jesus. And you know what? It is. It starts there. It's me and Jesus. It's me giving my life to Jesus. But it doesn't stop there. Christianity is not a lone ranger, solo gig that I'll live. I don't need to go to church to be a Christian. Well, technically, you're right. You don't. Well, I don't need to read the Bible to be a Christian. Well, technically, you're right. You don't. The only thing you need to do is surrender your life to Jesus and be forgiven of your sins. But God has designed you and I as Christians to grow in the context of a body, in the context of relationships, in the context of friendships, in a, in a home group, in a Sunday morning church or a Wednesday evening service or a men's ministry on Wednesday mornings at 9 o'clock or a women's ministry on Saturday mornings, right? I mean, the, all the different places that God has designed us to grow in these ways. It's not something we do on our own. And secondly, men and women, these gifts are for the glory of Jesus. So what that means is when a Christian is operating in our spiritual gift... Um, the Holy Spirit, the gift of the Holy Spirit, we're going to glorify, magnify Jesus. Look at it this way. I just saw this not too long ago. I saw it yesterday in that horrible game um, that, well, Thursday night, rather, that we'll call the Broncos game, if you want to call it that. Um, I, I, when someone athlete that we pay a lot of money to, right, and those athletes, when they do 
big things, they get a lot of attention on them, don't they? They, they are lauded, they are applauded, they are praised, they are focused on, athletes are successful ones. Man, kids want to be them, they want to wear their jerseys. But when an athlete picture on the field, whatever field it is or on the court, when they do something amazing, I was at a Rapids game probably two years ago, and they were playing RSL, Real Salt Lake. And, and one of the Real Salt Lake players scored a goal against the Rapids, and it was an amazing goal. And I remember what he did is he, instead of focusing on himself, he did this, right? And you've seen people do that. In many ways, it can be, hey, don't look at me, look at, but now it's oftentimes, well, this is for you, Dad, or this is for you, Mom, you know, up in heaven. We don't know who it's for necessarily. I, I always like to believe that it's, this is for you, Jesus, but this guy left no doubt about it because then he ripped off his shirt, his jersey, and under his jersey was another shirt that said, I love Jesus. No question about it. He went like this, and then before his team could tackle him like they always do, he ran around and he flipped off his shirt, and he had another shirt that said, I love Jesus. <laughs> there is no question about it. He was doing it for God's glory, right? Whenever you and I have the opportunity to use our spiritual gifts, it's not to make us look big or better. It's not make, to be, make people think, oh, Brandon's so spiritual. Oh, Brandon's so good at what he does, or Charles is so good, or fill in your name. It's not about us. When we do our, operate in our spiritual gifts, the way it's supposed to work is people walk out of this room, hopefully if I've done my job, and they say, isn't Jesus awesome? Isn't Jesus? I want to know Jesus more. You see, my prayer is that Jesus, on a Sunday morning, at least at Vista Church, would be high and lifted up. Amen. That Jesus would be the focus, that he would be the attention. It's not about us getting the glory. It's about Jesus getting the glory. And remember, <laughs> that's a big part of what the Holy Spirit is doing in the life of every one of us as believers. He's making us look more like Jesus in the way that we live out our faith. In fact, the Bible says we are being made into the image of God's own Son. Remember when Moses was up on Mount Sinai? Remember when he was getting those Ten Commandments? If you don't remember, just think of Charlton Heston. And then, then, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, Charlton, Ten Commandments. Well, you remember he was up there, and when he was up there, he was in the presence of God, right? Yahweh. And because he was in the presence of Yahweh, do you remember what was happening? He began to reflect the glory of God. His face literally was beaming. It was shining. It was like the best facial that anybody could ever get. All micro, you know, dermabrasion was happening. And I mean, he was just radiating the glory of God so much so that he began to hide his face because he didn't want the glory to go away. He's like, oh, quit looking at me. You know, I, I want to keep this glory to myself. And, and this is Exodus 34 if you want to read it on your own. But listen to what Paul says about this situation and about us. He says in 2 Corinthians 3, therefore, since we have such hope, we use great boldness of speech. He says, unlike Moses, who put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the end of what was passing away as that glory diminished, he says, and we all who with Contrary to Moses, with unveiled faces, all reflect the Lord's glory. Isn't that awesome? You and I have the ability to reflect the glory of the Lord and not to try and keep it for ourselves. You know, quit looking at me. I don't want the glory to go away. No, man, we want to shine the glory of Jesus Christ. We're being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit, as the Spirit of God is making us look more like Jesus. That's what it means right there in verse 18, being transformed into his likeness with ever increasing, increasing glory. We have the privilege of reflecting who Jesus is to this world. You know, we, we were called to be salt and light. We're called to be his ambassadors as if he's making his appeal through us. And you know what? I, I don't want to go out there and somehow reflect myself and try and point people to Jesus. I want people to see Jesus in what we do as a church. Amen? 
We've got a couple of uh, ministry opportunities that we're going to be doing. Kristen and I are community outreach coordinator. We talked this last week. We're going to be do, doing something with the food pantry again for Thanksgiving. And then we're going to be doing Operation Christmas Child with the shoe boxes. We're going to be doing that for Christmas. And my prayer is that as we do those things and all the others that we have and will do, is that people see Jesus in our actions. People understand that it's not us, it's, it's Jesus, and that he would get the glory. That's what it's supposed to be. It's what he told his disciples, Jesus. He said in John 14, 12, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also in greater works than these the person who believes in me will do, because I go to my Father. And so you look at what the Holy Spirit will do to make us look more like Jesus. Consider how Jesus lived. Jesus did miracles, did he not? Miracles is a gift of the Holy Spirit. Je Jesus healed people, did he not? Healing is a gift that the Holy Spirit gives. I believe God is still healing people today. Amen? Got a great story about that when the time comes. Uh, Jesus spoke for God. He, he, he spoke forth God's truth. That is the gift of prophecy, and that's a gift of the Holy Spirit. Jesus served, ministered to people, did he not? That is a gift of the Holy Spirit. And I could continue with all the other spiritual gifts. You get the point. Jesus operated in every gift of the Holy Spirit and all the fruit of the Spirit. And we are able to do what Jesus did for his glory, not for our glory, not for the church's glory, not for even the glory of the gifts. When we're operating in the gifts of the Spirit, it will build up the church and it will glorify Jesus. Just as much when a church is operating maturely, correctly, in the power of the Holy Spirit, I believe people take notice of that kind of church. If it's ours, if it's any others, people take notice. Just like when a husband and a wife are loving each other the way that Christ loved the church. We'll look at this in Ephesians 6 as we get more towards the end of the book. When, when, when a husband and wife are loving each other, serving each other, uh, work, working together as, as a unit with their spiritual gifts, guess what? Jesus gets the glory. That, that's exactly what he's going to talk about in Ephesians 6. When you and I, or Ephesians 5 rather, when you and I as husbands and wives love each other that way and respect each other that way, then Jesus gets the glory. People look at us and say, man, what's different about them? And we point people to the source of all of those things. And guess what? When Jesus is glorified, I believe more people will come to know him. When Jesus is high, it's whatever brought me to Jesus. It's whatever opened my eyes to how awesome the Lord was. This guy, I knew he was loving for the Lord. He was loving Jesus. And he was, sir, I mean, it was impressive. And I was 20 years old and this kid was like 17 and I heard all about him, and, and the way that he was living for Jesus is secretly, or at least inwardly, the way that I kind of always wanted to, and I never could. And, and, and he was loving the Lord, and he was being a witness like no one's business. He was just talking about what Jesus did for him. He didn't care what people thought of him, even at 17 years of age. And I remember that, that he invited me to come to this youth group. He's like, Brandon, you need to come. I'm like, no, I don't need that. And he invited me again. No, I don't need that. He invited me over and over and over and I'm like, I wanted to, but yet I didn't. I wanted to. And then finally I said, okay. And I went. <clears throat> and I met Jesus that night in a way that I had never met Jesus before. I gave my life to Christ that night. And within 30 days, I knew I wanted to be a pastor. And that's how it went. And it was all because of that kid who was living for Jesus shining Jesus, it drew me. I'm like, I wanted to draw close. And then suddenly I did, and my life was changed. How about you? That's how it works, amen? When Jesus is glorified, people will come to know him. Now, I, I, I wax too long. Let's go back to Romans 12. He says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. He says, holy, acceptable, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable act of worship. None of that's up there. That's okay. All right? Paul just finished in Romans 11 talking about mercy. You can look, look at this on your own. Uh, the mercy that was shown to the Jews, and Paul in Romans 11 talked about the mercy that was shown to the Gentiles. Everyone needs the mercy of God. 
Mercy is not getting what we deserve, right? Grace is getting what we don't deserve. Mercy is not getting what we do deserve. For the wages of sin is, that's what we deserve. But because of the mercy of God, Jesus took our place and he died on the cross for our sins. Amen? And he poured out his mercy. Through Jesus, he took what we deserved and we avoided what we deserve. So in light of the mercy of God, give your life to him as a living sacrifice. That's what Paul is saying. In light of the mercy that I just talked about in Romans chapter 11 for so much, in light of that mercy, give your life to Jesus as a living sacrifice. Whatever he wants you to do, give your life to him. Now, that's, that's really important for you to see. This is key to operating in spiritual gifts. Jesus sacrificed his life on the cross and he died. That's not required of us. That's not the sacrifice he's asking. You and I dying on any cross, dying on any hill for our mistakes and sins, it's not what we required because Jesus already did it. Amen? He took our place. But we can offer ourselves to God as a living sacrifice. And Paul says that when we do that, it's our spiritual act of worship or service. And so literally it means, God, here is my life, right? I'm no longer going to live for myself, but now I'm going to live for you and for your glory. Now, that's what he says next in Romans 2, I beseech you, therefore, as he goes on, he says, and do not conform to this world. Now stop, do not conform to this world. What is the way the world approaches life? If we're not supposed to conform to this world, uh, instead, we're supposed to be transformed. What is the way this world approaches life, their life, my life, your life? I, as far as I can tell, this world looks and they says, my life is my own. I'll do with my life, with my talent, with my skills, what I want. Well, however I want to live it, it's going to be for me. Whatever stuff I have, it's for me. It's for what I want to do with. It's all about self. It's about me, and that is the pattern of this world. But contrast that <laughs> with what we're challenged to be about, but instead be transformed, he says, by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The only way you'll ever know and be in agreement with the will of God in heaven is as you choose to give your life to him. And I don't just mean that initially for salvation, though that is definitely included, right? I mean, that's what happens when you and I surrender our lives to Jesus. We're literally coming to that place where we're saying, all right, Lord, um, you created me. You, you died on the cross for me. So I accept you as my Lord and Savior. Now here's my life. I belong to you now. That's the initial point of salvation, giving your life to Christ. That's how we even talk about it. Give your life to Jesus, right? Whenever you go to a Billy Graham crusade, back when he was doing those, um, he would always come forward and give your life to Jesus, right? In any one of the great evangelists, it's always about giving your life to Jesus. But guess what? It doesn't just stop there. Oh, I gave my life to Jesus back in 1972. I'm good. How about you? No, we keep giving our lives to Jesus, right? We, we, we keep giving our, our talent, our time, our treasure, who we are. We keep giving them and offering them and say, Jesus... Here's my life. How do you want to use it? If, if you thought being a Christian just meant that you gave your life to him once and then now you do whatever you want and live however you want and, and operate all for yourself, you're not really understanding what the rest of Scripture has to say. And that's what I want to teach you this morning. It's a great privilege to continue to give your life to Jesus Christ. Paul said it this way in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14. He said... For the love of Christ compels us, because we judge thus, that if one died for all, then all died. We've, we, we die to ourselves, right? Jesus died to himself, and we die to ourselves as well. My desires, my wants, my plan, my will, that all dies. And now we say like Paul, we say like Jesus, nevertheless, not my will be done, but See, that's that surrender. He goes on to say, and he died for all, that those who live, speaking of Christians, should no, live no longer for who? 
These are Paul's words, inspired of the Holy Spirit, that those who live should no longer live for themselves. You already read ahead. I know you did. But for him who died for them and rose again. You see, growing in our maturity and faith means we no longer live for my own desires, my own wants, my own will. Here's what I want. Here's what I'm going to do. Here's what I want to be about. No. As Christians, we say, I'm no longer going to live for myself, but I'm going to live for you, Jesus. I'm going to present myself to you, Jesus. He he said it this way in 1 Corinthians 6, 19. He says, you are not your own. You, You don't belong to yourself anymore. Instead, he says, for you were bought with a price or at a price. And what was that price? That price was the blood of Jesus Christ. That price was him dying on the cross. Therefore, he says... Because you're not your own, because you were bought with a price, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are whose? Your body and your spirit are not your own. You belong, I belong, we belong to God. My life is in his hands. And he, if he wants me to do whatever it is as he shows me, guess what? I didn't want to be a pastor. And that's the last thing I ever thought I wanted to do with my life. And for 27 years, guess what I've been? A pastor. I wanted to be a developer. I wanted to do real estate. I was halfway through my business real estate degree at Washington State University. I'm like, yeah, this is what I'm going to do. And suddenly I gave my life to Christ that night and I began to pray at 20 years of age. Lord, you know what I want to do. Is that what you want me to do? I never thought to ask that before. What do you want me to do? Come on. Is that what you Christians really do? I thought, what do you want me to do? But I prayed that. And like I said, within 30 days, within one month, I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that God wanted me to be a pastor. I changed my degree from business real estate. I changed it to history so that I could study the Greeks and the Romans and the early Middle Ages and the late Middle Ages, study the Protestant Reformation, all things having to do with religion. It was much more appropriate for being a pastor. And then I went on and I got my master in divinity because I wanted to preach God's word and I wanted to be thoroughly equipped and do it in a way that I felt like was right. Man, I never thought about those things. But that's what happens when we present ourselves. And I'm not saying if you present yourself, if you haven't already, that suddenly you're going to have to stop doing what you are doing and start doing what I'm doing. No, that's why it's one body, many parts. That's why God has different things for all of us. This is the beauty. We are not our own. Our time, our talent, our treasure now, it belongs to him. But he's not done explaining this whole thing. Look at Romans 12, verse 3, as we go on. For I say, through the grace given to me to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself or herself more highly than he or she ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. So not only is the pattern of this world to live for myself, to put myself first, and to do what I want with my life, it's also to live for my own glory. It's also to live that people might look at me and see me, that people might notice what I do, what I have, what I drive, what I, where I live, how I dress, what's on my wrist or what's on my, you name it. It's all about look, 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 look at me, right? For my glory. And I'm not just describing some esoteric thing. I'm literally describing why advertisers operate as much as they do and make as much as they do on Madison Avenue. I'm describing why so much of this world is in debt to get more, newer, better, because we have this misconception that the stuff of this world is going to somehow make us look better, make people notice us more. But not only that, it's also the pattern of this world to believe that I don't need anyone else, to think that I'm in control and I'm above everyone else, I'm better than everybody else, and I don't need the help of others. It's one of the maxims of faith that we need each other. I've said it before, that we can't do this alone, being a Christian, that we need to be a part of the body of Christ. And when we are, that's where we'll grow and mature and be our best. That's why he says, don't think of yourself more highly. Don't put yourself up on that plane. Man, just think of yourself the way you should, which is with humility and that we all need each other. 
The, the, the more that I walk with Jesus, the less I realize I've got it together. It doesn't mean I'm out doing stupid things. It just means the more I walk with Jesus, the less I put my faith in myself and the more I ask. And you know what? That's happened for me even as a pastor. I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I like speaking. I enjoy being in front of people in a way that I hope use, glorifies Jesus. But the more that I've done this, the more terrified I am that I'm not doing it right, which causes me to say, Jesus, you got to do it through me. Jesus, I, I can't do this on my own. I can't stand behind this little, little whatever pulpit this, this is. I need Jesus to speak through me because if he doesn't, it's just the sound of Brandon Hoover. <laughs> no one cares about that. I want the sound of Jesus Christ to come through his word. And if I can reflect that in any, and I realize I need that so much more. And, and I think that's the humility that we all should have. And I'm growing in it. I, I'm maturing in it. And he goes on in verse 4, for as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, so we, being many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Now, stop and think about that. We get finally to the gifts. You and I need these gifts. I need these gifts. We all generally refer to as the ministry gifts. So let's read them. Having them gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching. He who exhorts in exhortation. He who gives with liberality. He who leads with diligence. And he who or she who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Now, let's break them down, all right? Prophesying, what does that look like? Prophesying literally is the foretelling or the forth telling of God's word. That's literally what it is. What I'm doing right here is using the gift of prophecy. Hopefully with the gift of words of wisdom and words of knowledge. Uh, ho hopefully with humility. But it's foretelling or forth telling. Now, foretelling literally is what the prophets would do. They would speak what's going to happen. Do you remember when Agabus the prophet was telling the apostle Paul that if he went to Jerusalem... They were going to bind him. In fact, he took his belt and he said, he wrapped it around Paul and he said, in the same way that I have just bound you with this belt, that's going to happen to you if you go to Jerusalem. He was foretelling God's truth. Now today, there's a lot of conventions or there's a lot of seminars where, where people will say, hey, if you come listen to this guy, he's going to tell you your future. That, 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 that's what this gift is. He's going to tell you what's going to happen to you. But I, what I want you to know that that's not the gift of prophecy in the sense of how God wants to use it just to tell people their future. He wants to let people know how it is that they can live for him. Amen? That's why Agabus was telling Paul what's going to happen if you go. And Paul's like, I don't care, man. I'm going. And if that's what happens, I'm okay with that. And guess what? It did happen. And because it happened, that's exactly how God got Paul to Rome in the first place. Because he was bound and chained and he was imprisoned. And he said, uh, to Caesar I appeal. And then that's how we get the book of Romans, right? We also see in prophecy the forth telling of God's truth. Speaking God's truth. Here's God's truth. Letting people hear God's truth. Whenever you share the word of God with somebody, you are using the gift of prophecy. And it's something that God wants you to do. To forth tell his truth. Now, secondly, we have the gift or the, the gift of ministry, the gift of service. And this is people who give of their time and their talent to help someone in need. Somebody with the gift of ministry or the gift of service sees needs, and they don't just say, well, I'll pray for you, and then walk away. This person says, I see the need, now what can I do? And they step forward with their time. They step forward with the gifts that God has given them, and they serve that person. Uh, my wife has the gift of service. She's amazing in that gift. I love it. She does it so well. Wherever she's at, she's serving people. She puts people's needs before her own. And I'm not just building her up because I'm going to have lunch with her this afternoon. I I'm literally showing you this is how these gifts operate. And if you know my wife, you know that she operates in that way. And some of you operate in that way as well. Thirdly, we have the gift of teaching. And the gift of teaching is just literally breaking down the truth of God's word in understandable ways. 
And so hopefully I have the gift of teaching. And when you walk out, you understood God's word better than you did when you came in. The, the, the teachers that are in the children's ministry right now teaching, if you have kids, your children, they're breaking down God's word into understandable ways for those children. And when Dre on a, on a Tuesday youth night is teaching to the youth, he's using that gift. It's not just in front of a crowd. It's even when you and I have a chance to talk to our kids about Jesus and we share the word of God with them, we can even use the gift of teaching there, helping them understand God's truth. We've got the gift of prophecy, the gift of ministry or service. We've got the gift of teaching. Then we have the gift of exhortation. Encouragement, as some of your words, versions say. Coming alongside someone who needs courage they don't have on their own, right? You're giving them encouragement. You're giving them that exhortation. And through the words that you're sharing with them, you're building them up. How many of you, when you've been in a rough place, someone came along, whether or not it was a friend or a spouse, uh, maybe a pastor or who knows who it could have been, but when they shared a word with you, they talked to you in such a way, you walked away feeling encouraged, like, all right, I can do this. All right, I felt like I couldn't do whatever it is, but now because of the courage they imparted to me. Folks, these are spiritual powerhouses that help the body grow in so many ways. Uh, we have the gift of giving. And the gift of giving is someone who understands they're, they're only stewards of God's stuff, and they use their stuff to worship God. They don't worship their stuff. Instead, they use their stuff to worship God. They present it. Now, the truth is we're all called to be givers, all right? We're all called to give. If you sow generously, you will reap generously. If you sow sparingly, you will reap sparingly. We're all called to be cheerful givers. But the people with the gift of giving don't have to be prodded or encouraged or exhorted they don't have to be reminded, hey, you know what? The Bible says they don't have to be taught. These people, before anyone ever says a thing, they're already writing a check or swiping a card because they love to see God's truth and God's word. They love to see the church grow. And so these people give and they give sacrificially. Then we have the gift of leadership. Those that are willing to put it on the line and say, like Paul did, follow me as I follow Christ, right? These are the people that when a need comes up, and I'll talk about it in a minute, they, they step out and they say, follow me, I got this. Hey, uh, maybe that sounds wrong. Follow me because God's got this, right? And as I follow him, you can follow me. The gift of leadership is very important in the body of Christ. And some of you have this gift, and some of you operate in this gift, and I love that gift. The gift of mercy is the amazing gift of compassion when someone else is up against it. You're not coming there to try and lecture them. You're not coming there to try and teach them something they didn't know. You're just coming alongside of them. You're wrapping your arms around them with someone who has the gift of mercy, and you're just saying, man, I'm sorry you're going through this. Man, I'm sorry, and I'm here. If you want to cry on my shoulder, go ahead. You see how powerful these gifts are when they operate in the body of Christ? So you might say, well, how do I know which gift I have? And I'll, I'll tell you this, when it comes to um, this list and the list we'll look at next week, um, there are spiritual gift tests that you can take. Uh, you can Google spiritual gift test and one will come up. I'll download one and I'll have them in the back at the end of this uh, two-week se little service ser uh, seminar I'm doing, whatever you want to call it, segue, um, if you want to discover what your spiritual gift is. But another person has said, Charles Swindoll, the best way is just to jump involved in ministry. Get involved. Start serving in a way. And what you start to incline yourself towards, what you start to find yourself um, operating in, Charles says, is oftentimes the gifting then that you have and you can get affirmation. If when I said I wanted to be a pastor, and I talked to several um, individuals, pastors at that time who knew me, and I said, hey, here's what I feel like the Lord is telling me to do. If they would have looked at me and said, hmm, we really have question about that. We, we really don't see that in you. It seems like if they would have in any way prayed with me and cautioned me, then I would have listened. But instead, I said, here's what I'm thinking of doing. And one guy gave me the opportunity at a youth group to talk for the first time, and I was scared to death. But I had, an, I don't even know what I said. But afterwards, there was fruit, and afterwards, there was fulfillment. 
And that is how you know, men and women, when you're operating in your spiritual gift. Fruit will follow, and you'll have fulfillment as well. You'll enjoy it. Now, there are some who, there's fruit that follows when they do whatever it is they do, but they don't enjoy it. It's arduous. It's difficult. And they still operate it in, but you know what? It's like when the two come together, because on the flip side, there are some who have, I love what I'm, I love being up front and singing, but you know what? There's no fruit because we all can't stand your voice, and so you shouldn't be up front, give the gift back, right? <laughs> that happens. Oh, over the 27 years, you better believe, Bill laughs, administrator at this church and our last church, we had people all the time that wanted to be up front, put the microphone in their hand. Oh, yes, I love being up front, but their voice didn't matter. God didn't gift them that way. And so there needs to be not just fulfillment, but also fruit. Yes, you're gifted in this. So how do I know? Gift test, fruit and fulfillment. But remember, all are needed and operate differently. So here's, here's a situation. Imagine that uh, all seven of these gifts are represented in a group that met for dinner. Let's say I invited you all over to my house, and we were going to have what I love to have. We were going to have a big plate of bacon, all right? We were, it, was, it was there, and, and uh, we were going to have some steaks and some sushi and whatever else you like to, I'll, I'll ask. And we're all there, all seven of those gifts. But as I come out to bring the, the dish out onto the table, um, suddenly it, it, it flops and spills and dumps out all over the floor. There, there goes all the bacon, fresh, crackling, salt and pepper all over it. it. It's just all over the floor now. And some would say, crucify him. You know, I get it. <laughs> but hear this, imagine. So here are the possible responses from each one of these gifts and explanations of what would motivate their words. If that happened, someone with the gift of prophecy might say, well, that's what happens when you're not careful, Brandon. <laughs> Please try and be more careful in the future. And if, they, if, if a scripture came to their mind about the situation, they might try and apply that quote or that scripture so that this person could grow. Their motivation is to correct the problem, the gift of prophecy. If someone has the gift of service in that dumped tray of bacon, that person might say, oh, let me help you clean it up. They're, they're not looking to tell me about, you know, be more careful. They're just like, hey, let me, let me help. They jump right in there. They don't question at all the gift of service, and they're there to meet a need. That's their motivation. Someone with the gift of teaching might say, well, Brandon, it fell because it was too heavy on one side, which could have been avoided if you checked the balance of the dish when you made the plate of bacon or before you lifted it off the counter. Their motivation, the gift of teaching, is to help me discover why I dropped it. And that is the gift of teaching. You want people to discover what it is that they're doing. Someone with the gift of exhortation or encouragement might say, next time, serve the dessert from a different dish, and, and, and then everything will be all right. And their motivation is to encourage and prepare for the future. Someone with the gift of giving might say, I'll be happy to buy a new plate of bacon. And, and, and their motivation is to give or to meet the tangible need. Someone with the gift of leadership might say, Brandon, would you get... Get the mop. Sue, please help pick it up. Mary, come help me fix another plate of bacon. And their motivation would be to help the group work together to achieve the immediate goal of fixing this horrible problem. And lastly, someone with the gift of mercy might say, don't feel badly, Brandon. It could have happened to anyone. And their motivation would be to comfort the person responsible for the atrocity and offer sympathy. <laughs> now listen, Realize these gifts and all the rest aren't our gifts. As you can see, the gift is given to the need of the person who has the need, right? We're conduits for God to use. More often than not, this Romans 12 list, um, I've heard pastors say, it's more of a resident gift. Uh, people, these gifts reside in people longer term, right? Right? So if someone has the gift of leadership, it's not just for one circumstance. If someone has the gift of service, it's not just for one situation. Uh, the people that have these ministry gifts, they operate in these more, you know, like regularly. You know, gift of teaching, it's not just one teaching and then, oh, I don't have that gift anymore, now I suck. No, it's someone who has that gift, they're gifted in that on a regular basis. When we get to next week's gifts, 1 Corinthians 12 
you'll see what I'm going to say is I don't see this, those as often as being resident in people. I see those being non-resident as any need arises. Any one of us can be used with the 1 Corinthians 12 gifts of, list of gifts. And so keep that in mind. And in the end, I pray that you would, and I would, and we all would use the gift, discover them, use them for the glory of Jesus and to build up the body. Amen? Lord, thanks for your word this morning.